Good afternoon, everyone. This is producer Hamilton coming to you with a new episode of Making the Argument. Yes, Team Freitas is not in the studio today, but don't click off just yet, because last week, Nick joined Logan Hanks on the Living Fully Loaded podcast. And as I was sitting here in the studio listening to them record, I knew this was an episode we would need to share with you. Logan and Nick discussed all types of things, such as American resiliency, homesteading, the future of agriculture and food in the United States, marriage, parenthood, and how Nick's upbringing and worldview has informed his political philosophy and so much more. Also, if you're a fan of Westerns, I think you'll like this as well. Thank you for joining us again on this episode of Making the Argument, and we'll see you back in the studio this Thursday. What's up, everybody? This is Logan Hanks with the Living Fully Loaded podcast. Got an awesome, awesome episode for you guys today. I'm joined by somebody I've, I've really enjoyed following along and, and seeing what he says and he's also got one of his awesome coffee cups in the the video today um and that is mr nick freitas nick thank you for joining me man no thanks very much for having me on absolutely absolutely uh I'll tell you man your your page is a, a breath of fresh air um <laughs> in today's today's world is kind of what i would describe it as and i'm excited to uh, share your story and get into it but first Got a couple little quick questions for you. First one, man, what film? You got to watch one film for 24 hours in a row. What are you watching? Oh, man. So it's got to be like one movie, right? Not a series. That'd be cheating. Well, I've had people that have cheated. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> you can do both. If I would, you picked a series, I would probably what would you pick? Go, oh, man, this is tough. It would, it would either be El Dorado um, or Rio Bravo. Yeah. And I'd probably go with Rio Bravo. I mean, even though I, I like I like James, a young James Conant. You know, those are both John Wayne movies, obviously. Yeah. El Dorado had a young James Conant that was really cool. I don't really like Robert Mitchum. Um, but it, you also had, um, oh, gosh, um, Dean Martin in uh, Rio yeah. Bravo. So I'm, I'm, oh, no, I'm sorry. Robert Mitchum was in El Dorado. So, yeah, with, with, with Dean Martin – um, Walter Brennan and, uh, and, and John Wayne in Rio Bravo. And what was it? Angie Dickinson, I think, um, that, that, that takes the cake. The only one out of that, the only one of that John Wayne cast that's missing would be Maureen O'Hara, um, who is just yeah. awesome. But yeah, so I, I'd probably go with Rio Bravo. That's a good one, man. That's a good one. I, I, see now I'm torn. I'm torn on that then. So you're, are you more of a, a John Wayne than Clint Eastwood guy? If you um, had to pick between the two, me and my son have this battle. Um, and, and I love my son to death. So <laughs> it was so heartbreaking to have to drop him off at the orphanage for this, but uh, he, uh, he would probably, he would probably side with, uh, Clint Eastwood and he would probably go with for a few dollars more. Yeah. 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 Me and him are all pretty well in line then, because I fistful of dollars and few dollars more yeah. are my my favorites. I mean, I love the good, the bad, and the ugly, but you know, I feel like that one's almost a cop out. Like yeah. I feel like people that say that's their favorite, I'm like, so have you ever even actually seen it? You know, like I'm kind of like I'm almost leery when people tell me that's their favorite Clint movie. Yeah, no, I I agree with you. I, I think uh, High Plains Drifter was another great one, but. What, what's yeah. okay? Oh gosh, wait a second. I'm about to I'm about to lose all my credibility here. It was a few dollars more that was the uh, the 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 shootout between uh, Lee Van Cleef and the the bad guy, right? The one where they had the pocket watch with the music. You know what I'm talking about? Oh gosh, well I get few dollars more and fistful of dollars right? mixed up all the time. Yeah, because it's, what, it's I, almost so, like a sequel. Yeah. It right, is, but man. It was, they're 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 too similar. So you didn't lose yeah. any cred there. Maybe both of us just <laughs> lost credibility there. I don't know, but I'm the same. I get I get those two mixed up. So I'm yeah. always like, those two are my favorite Clint ones. Yeah. Um, now yeah. and, and you know I love the no hate on the good, the bad, and ugly. That showdown at the end when the three of them are around. I mean, I love that. It's an awesome scene. But yeah. that movie is a good three hours and a long or whatever. So, um. But yeah, no, man, that's good. Westerns. Have you ever seen any modern Westerns that you think are as good as the classics? Um, I, I thought, I thought Unforgiven was pretty good. Um, that's kind of a cop out answer, but legitimately I thought it was, I thought it was a good one. Um, the other one, Oh, what was the one they just did? Um, dang it. I'm forgetting the name now. I actually saw it in the theaters. Um, shoot. He's like, the what hostile yes thank you 
Yeah. I actually, I actually thought Hostiles was was pretty well done. I, I was surprised because some of the, yeah. you know, I, I just I don't have a lot of faith in Hollywood to be able to create a good, um, a, a good western anymore because there were certain elements in a western uh, that just required you know elements of you know now what Hollywood consider to be toxic masculinity and you know overly patriotic yeah. and, and these were just important components of of good westerns and that's not to say you couldn't have like a really tortured hero like in the searchers john wayne's the searchers yeah. was just excellent um but i actually thought hostiles did a did a pretty a pretty good uh pretty good job um i i liked um as far as series goes um i i liked the i had kind of a love-hate relationship with it but i liked 1883 um, yeah, God, you know, that is the most depressing show oh, on the planet. My God, <laughs> you know it, it, I, the other thing too that shocked me is that if you had ever told me that Tim McGraw and, and uh, Faith Hill <laughs> would do a halfway decent job acting, I would have told you were nuts. But um, yeah. you know, you you had you had Sam Elliott there, which I mean, shoot, is a beast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that but that was I thought that was a a pretty good um, modern one. You know. Yeah, yeah. 1883 is probably, that is probably one of the best modern Western. I mean, as a, even though it's a series, it had that very, you know, that raw feel to it, that grittiness of them. But, but dude, the, the last two episodes were the most gut-wrenching oh, yeah. thing I've ever watched. Like, yeah. I, that's what, I mean, my wife came in and I was finishing watching, like, the last episode or something. Oh, and I mean, she can tell, she's like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, this is the, I'm like, all I'm trying to do is power through this show yeah. so that I can be done with it. I like, gotta know how it I is. I just wanted to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Especially if, if that one dad, had ended man. on like the eighth episode, yeah. then I would have been like happy with it. But yeah, as a dad, I think is why it's oh, so hard to watch. Is that what man. made it tough for you? Yes. Oh, like I, so I got two daughters and a son. So I got a 19 year old daughter, 16 year old son, a 14 year old daughter. And yeah, especially, you know, uh, I mean, my, my son and I are tight. Um, it, but it was funny. I always tell, I always tell my buddies and whatnot when I was in the military, it, you know, whenever they found out, Hey, you know, buddy, I'm, 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 you know, I'm having a kid. Oh, great. You know, boy or girl. And as soon as they said, girl, I'm like, you're about to find out what a sap you are. <laughs> <laughs> you think yeah. you're a you think you're a tough guy and then you have a little girl and next thing you know you're like learning how to you know braid hair and have tea parties and yeah <laughs> yeah yeah dude that's i've i have uh so i've got twins but they're four years old yeah. and boy girl twins so i got one of each and dude i'm with you man my my daughter i mean i love you know I'll, i'm gonna do the typical parent answer i love both of my kids equally but my my daughter definitely she can just man they can just break down that that barrier man it's just something about it oh they, I, I think there's a reason for it. It, it like you said you know typical dad caveat right like i i do i i genuinely love all of my kids um you know the same as <laughs> you don't have favorites uh there's just different ways that you connect with daughters versus ways you connect with sons and the same thing with with moms and their boys yeah. and, and the whole deal i mean you know I, like love my mom to death. And, but you know, the way my mom and I interact is, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's my mama, the way my dad and I yeah. interact. I mean, it, like, <laughs> the first, first time I went over to Tina's house for dinner, my wife, Tina's house for dinner. Um, and, or I shouldn't say that it was the first time my mother-in-law saw my father and I interact. And my dad was a, a homicide detective with the Los Angeles police department. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, she, um, she, and then my grandfather too, my grandfather was, you know, Navy at 16 in world war two, and then a firefighter and the whole deal. So she was watching, like, I think either the two of us or the three of us interact. And she's like, I didn't realize, you know, Nick had kind of a, a troubled relationship with his, his dad and grandfather. And my wife's <laughs> like, they like adore, like he adores his dad and grandfather. That's just yeah. the way they interact. Right? Yeah. 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 Dude, that's, you know, it, it, I, I was imagining when you were describing that, I'm imagining the scene in uh, Predator whenever Arnold's walking up to uh, 
Oh, Carl Weathers, and he goes, Dylan, I think his name's Dylan. Dylan, you son of a bitch. Yeah. And like grabs his hand. <laughs> like that's what I'm picturing on that. But but I get it, man. Similar, like say my my dad's a, a farmer. I come from that. His dad was yeah. a World War II vet and all that. I mean, that's just the way, you know, it's different. You know, I don't go up and yeah, I'm not hugging my dad when I walk up to him. Like yeah. that's just we have a great relationship, but it's yeah. just different, different style, I guess. Yeah. Um yeah. Well, man, uh, I think it's a great way we've kind of broke the ice. So I guess give us a quick rundown for people that, that maybe don't follow you or want to learn a little more about you. Tell us who you are and uh, kind of where you're at and all those things. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, I introduced you to my dad. He was former LAPD. My mom was actually a, is, is still a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 40 years now. Also did some missionary work overseas, Christian missionary work that I got to go with her on some of that. Um, you know, joined the military right out of high school. Also met my wife in high school. We were high school sweethearts our senior year. Um, went through infantry basic training over at Fort Benning and then Airborne School. Joined the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, Tina and I got married uh, right about a year out of high school. Um, went from the 82nd over to the 25th in Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> three months after I got to Hawaii, 9-11 happened. And so oh, wow. uh, I, I volunteered for Army Special Forces. We also had our first daughter uh, out there on, a, on Oahu uh, at a um, Tripler Army Medical Center out there, the big pink hospital on the hill. Uh, went through SF, which kind of better known as Green Berets. Um, so we yeah. focused on, you know, unconventional warfare, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, that sort of thing. Uh, did a couple combat tours over in Iraq back in 06 and then again in 08. We also, when I was stationed at Fort Lewis, had our, uh, our, our son, Luke, and our, and our daughter, Allie, and uh, got out of the military in 09 and moved out to Virginia. I'd always wanted, I'm originally from Northern California. I'd always wanted to live in Virginia because um, I, I just love the history of it. Uh, it and I think yeah. it's beautiful. I, I really do. You know, California is, is a beautiful state. Um, but like everything was brown in the summer because pretty fairly dry and whatnot. I remember the first time I went to Virginia and everything was like lush and green in the summer. Now you pay the humidity price for that, but um, <laughs> yeah. But I it just it 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 was amazing to me that everywhere I went in Virginia, there was a, a history placard somewhere with you know whether it's you know Mount Vernon or Monticello or or Montpelier or Williamsburg, Yorktown, Civil War battlefields. Yeah. I mean it's just incredible to me, and I I love that stuff. And so got a, got a job working out here in Virginia doing defense work. And as soon as we could find a little 10 acres out here in Culpeper, Virginia, we, we moved out here with our family. Our, our oldest daughter at the time was seven. Like I said, she's 19 now. Um, and just kind of laid down our roots, had our little 10 acres, and it was great. And, um, I, you know, I kind of got involved locally with, with politics. I, I helped a, a guy I met that I respected, former uh, Army Ranger, um, a uh, ranger tab guy and um, got him elected to the state Senate. And a couple years later, people asked me if I'd run for office and, uh, and I wisely said, Nope. <laughs> and then uh, they, they came back about a year later and asked me to do it again. And so I said, you know, my wife kind of said, well, you know, you can't, you can't complain about stuff. If, if when you're being asked to step up and serve, if you're not going to do it. Yeah. And so I, I, I ran for the Virginia House of Delegates and got elected in 2015, did my first session in 2016. And um, so I'm still there uh, representing the uh, 30th House District, uh, which is actually the same district that James Madison had. Uh, so once really? upon a yeah, once upon a time, this region was um, once upon a time, this region was represented by the father of the Constitution. And now they got me. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's good, man. Right. That's good. You follow and yeah. follow in the roots, man. Yeah. No. So it, it's been a great experience, but, uh, you know, I, I get to serve on, you know, the, uh, the public safety committee. I chair the subcommittee that hears all the gun legislation and, and a lot of, a lot of people, if anybody does know me, a lot of them know me because of some of the work I've done on the second amendment. And, um, yeah. And then I also serve on the finance committee, education, and then courts of justice and whatnot. So, yeah, been in the House of Delegates for uh, seven years now, and uh, just living life with the family. We got our we got our chickens, our goats. Uh, we just got peacocks because we're morons. And uh, <laughs> next year, to listen to them things. Oh yeah, next year I think we're trying to upgrade to. Uh, we we'd like to get probably three, no more than four head of cattle, and uh, we're gonna try pigs again. We did it one year before, but um, one of the things I love is I love the homesteading movement. I just, I yeah. love the idea of American resiliency 
And, um, you know, yeah. not that everyone's got to do it at a certain level or whatnot, but, you know, we're real close to Joel Salatin out here, who's just a great guy. And um, it's it's been a it's been a blast kind of, you know, slowly easing into it. And um, it's just a lot of fun and it's a great experience for the kids. So, yeah, that's kind of a, a once over the <laughs> once over the world of, you know, my life. <laughs> Well, it's uh, man, it's, it's all fascinating to me, which I, I, uh, I never served the military. I've got a ton of respect for them. I just, you know, I've, I have known farming all my life. That's just, that's what I did, uh, what I do full time. And, um, so I, I love the fact that you're getting into the homesteading stuff too. I mean, I got right outside this building is my chickens are right here. I got goats back here. Nice. If you were closer, I would give you these goats. Um, because <laughs> and I, if we I were closer, even, my I daughter would, would take them. <laughs> well, that man, I, I'm like, I've offered them. I'll have people come by and they'll be like, man, I, I'll look at them goats. And I'm like, you want them? I'll put them in your car. You can take them home. Like you can have these goats. Um, the chickens, we eat the eggs, you know, I get, but my goats are pretty much pets. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, that's uh, man, that's that's cool to hear, especially on the cattle side. That's where we started. We actually began in the cattle uh, with, I guess, my grandfather. Wow! And then we got into it at, at our largest. We had over three hundred head, which wow. was pretty big for us here in Tennessee. But now we're down to about one hundred and twenty. Yeah. And I think, you know, all of this, it's interesting. All of this right now is an interesting thing because of the world we live in, and that's kind of one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. It's the homesteading thing because, you know, man, I'll be honest. I can, I can put on a tenfold hat. Sometimes I'm always kind of wondering, you know, what else, what's lurking and uh, see it, especially in the ag sector. You know, we're seeing a lot of, you know, Bill Gates is buying a ton of the farm ground. Yeah. I think he may even be the largest farmland owner now. And so I'm kind of, you know, what, what is really going on there? And that's where I'm curious, man. Do you see, like, getting into the homestead thing, do you see more Americans doing that? Or what What do you see kind of on the horizon in regards to our food chain and stuff like that? Well, I mean, I mean, thank God we got people like Thomas Massey in Congress. He's got the Prime Act right now, and he's trying to make it easier for people to be able to just, gosh, buy food from local farmers and, and not have to go through all these these massive bottlenecks uh, with respect to federal regulations and whatnot. And, and look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that every regulation out there is bad. Um, but when, when I can't go over to my neighbor and buy a steak from him, um, that, that yeah. hasn't been federally inspected, that's stupid. Um, yeah. and, and so I, I think that, you know, that, that's a good thing on some of the policy side. We're trying to work on some food freedom stuff here in Virginia, but, um, yeah, it, it's interesting because I've never, it, it probably hasn't been the last couple of years. Um, you know, I, I've never been concerned about what we see going on on kind of like a grand scale. Like I, I've always had this, you know, I, I think we all grew up in a, in a country where we think, look, in the United States, we got our issues, we got our problems, we got some politicians we wish we didn't have to deal with, we got some rules and regulations we wish we didn't have to deal with, but there's a general respect for individual liberty, property rights, self-determination. Yeah. You know, you do you, I'll do me. And, and as long as we're not bumping into one another, we're, we're free to go in our, our separate ways if we disagree. And we're not going to try to force the other one to do what we want. I just don't yeah. think that's the case anymore. Right. I, I think we have people and, and you saw this to some degree during, uh, well, to a large degree during COVID. But the part that is crazy to me is, is things like this. When the World Economic Forum um, and, and Klaus Schwab and these guys are getting up there and they're bragging ab about how they're going to push people to, you know, moving off of, you know, beef and meat and going to lentils and, and here's the first loaf yeah. of bread we made out of bugs and, <laughs> um, and, and stuff like, um, you know, the head of Pfizer. And this is back in 2016, I think, bragging about, hey, we're going to have this pill that you can use that has a microchip that sends a signal when you've digested it because that's going to help with compliance. And then you look at that and you go, that's nuts. Mm. And then all yeah. of a sudden, you know, the you know, media and politicians just dutifully show up and be like, oh, that's conspiratorial. It's not conspiratorial when they got up, said it, bragged about it, and had a whole thing called the Great Reset where they laid out specifically yeah. the way they plan to carry it out, right? That this is not me being conspiratorial. When when the same people that are telling me that you're gonna have a famine in certain parts of the world because of the war in Ukraine are the same people going in and telling 
Dutch farmers, which, by the way, the Netherlands is, I think, the second largest agricultural producer in the world after the United States, agricultural exporter outside of the United States, which is fascinating because it's like not even the size of New Jersey. Yeah, and they, yeah. and they, they are cutting down, you know, nitrates by something like I forget what it was, but it was going to cause roughly 30 percent of, of the cattle farmers in, in the Netherlands to essentially be, you know, up, you know, up the creek without a paddle and lose their yeah. lose their ranches. You, you don't get to then tell me that I, I don't you know, my concern is not justified. And so the, the, the question that we all started to look at was, OK, there's a lot of things that we want to do politically. I mean, Europe is not the United States. We actually have far better protections for things like, you know, your First Amendment, your property rights, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Second Amendment, et cetera. And, and that's and that's good. But again, we also yeah. saw that in a time of crisis, the government didn't have a problem, you know, pushing lines, blurring lines and crossing lines uh, in the name of public safety. And you had a lot of people that saw that, especially the sort of people that think that the government needs to be far more involved in everything you do from your education to your health care, to what you eat, to what you drive, everything. And yeah. so I, I started looking at this as, OK, I, I don't want just a political response to this. Right. I want a cultural response, which is why we do our things on like, we, our podcast, making the argument. It's why we do the why minutes like I, I want to make a cultural argument for why, you know, again, individual liberty and, and property rights and free markets are, are superior. But then I also wanted to look at, OK, how, how can I I have a responsibility to my family that regardless of what else happens, maybe we win some of these battles, maybe we don't. But at the end of the day, I still have a responsibility to feed, protect, shelter, clothe my family. And what yeah. are some ways that I can do this that um, we enjoy doing and teach us really good life lessons? I, I think, you know, kids having jobs on, on a farm, on, on a small homestead or whatever it is, and, and specifically learning how to deal with livestock um, where, you know, again, a, a garden's great. And I love we love having our gardens and, and the whole deal. But, man, it, you know, you, you let you let the cucumbers go a couple days. Nobody's going to be upset about that. Livestock need yeah. water every day, right? They, they need to be tended yep. to and teaching that responsibility to kids is great. So I, I would say like the answer to your first question, no, I, I don't think it's crazy. I don't think it's, you know, conspiratorial for people to say, look, I want to learn more about how I can be more resilient and how I provide for and protect my family. And then the, just yeah. the massive benefits you get from, from raising kids with that kind of experience and having your kids, you know, understand where their food comes from and, and how to grow it. Those are just good life lessons, whether or not, you know, politicians are doing stupid things or not. You know, I, yeah, I, I completely agree. And it, it, it helps maybe, I'm hoping that it'll help bridge that gap because there's such a huge gap now, especially, you know, I think about obviously that the ag side is near to my heart. Um, less than... 2%. They say it's around 1.3%, I think, of the population in the U.S. is farmers. Yeah. And actually, if you break that down, because to be classified a farmer, you have to sell like $1,000 worth of produce. Well, that's really not a lot yeah. uh, if you get down to it. So a lot of those that are in that percentage are actually, you know, it's probably... You know, and I don't mean this negatively, but they're like hobby farms. Yeah. And they're on the side. When you get down to like a full time farming, that's a very slim percent of the population. And uh, it was really interesting. The other day, there was this, I had put up a video kind of ranting about people attacking farming. So, especially, look, Roundup, I see a commercial every day on the TV. If you can, if you have so and so cancer, and it's been, you know, studies show it's linked to Roundup. Call so and so lawyer. All right, look, do I do I wish that we could farm with no chemical? You yeah, know, that'd be great, man. I'd love to be able to do that. And there is there's regenerative ag, and these things people are trying to kind of discover, and they're still tweaking. But on the global, the large scale, they're not sustainable. It's not a sustainable practice because there's a statistic I just recently saw that by the year 2050, I believe it was, farmers are going to have to grow 70% more food to sustain the population. Yeah. Now, regenerative ag and these things, they're awesome. They're great, but they don't produce the same yields. So it's a yield loss. We're already 
struggling to produce the necessary yields for the population. So you can't cut it back. And I saw this, it's an influencer on, uh, well, actually she was one of the singers from like the, I can't remember one of the, the big girl bands back in the two thousands or something. And she put up a video and she's conservative. Uh, she's politically conservative, but she put up this video and it was talking about uh, roundup found in bread, trace amounts of roundup. And somebody in the comments, I mean, it blows my mind, the, the disconnect. Somebody in the comments said farmers don't have to use chemicals to, to manage these weeds. And somebody said, well, what are you what is your solution? And they said, pull the weeds up. And I'm like, <laughs> pull the weeds up. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, did these people realize there's over 900 million acres of farmland yeah. in the United States? Yeah. Like I, I would like to see that person pull the weeds up on one acre and oh, see yeah. how, how that goes. Yeah. So it's crazy. So I, I love to hear, I love to hear the homesteading thing. And like you said, getting them in there and livestock, I was just thinking this morning, I got two bulls that I'm about to feed out for slaughter. And they were just, they were at the gate because I feed them in the morning and I feed them at night. Uh, it's some, some different, it's kind of a mixture of feed that I give them. And they, I said this morning, I said, man, it's like two Democrats waiting on me over there because they were just <laughs> mooing at me all morning waiting on their, their food stamps, man. Um, so it's, it's funny. It, it does. It is funny to get to, to see them. And uh, so I'm curious, man, like in all of that, your your polit politics and all these things, is that something, have you always been on the same page politically? It did your time in the military, did that kind of shift it? What, what got you to where you are in that, that mindset? So I, I would say that uh, earlier on, I, I would have been considered, um, I would have been considered more of kind of like your traditional conservative Republican. Um, over time, there was there was a couple different influences, and going to war affected it too. Where I, I became um, kind of more of what they consider like the the liberty wing of the Republican Party, and and the way I would differentiate those two is that um, you know I, I still I still have very very strong conservative. I mean, my faith is very my Christian faith is very very important to me. That's how we raise our kids. It's the foundation of my worldview. Yep. Um, but what that also has informed over time as I've kind of studied and I've researched this is the idea that there's, there's a lot of things that as a conservative earlier on, I would have been perfectly comfortable with the government trying to do or regulate. And as time went on, I became less comfortable with it. Um, not, not because I, I think that certain activities or, or certain practices are good or bad as much as it was. I have a lot less trust in politicians to be able to effectively do things that I don't think are, are necessarily legitimate functions of government. And so yeah. what, what happened over time, and this probably started around 2005, 2006 uh, for me, maybe a little bit later, was it was this idea that um, there, there are a lot of things that I might not like or prefer, but all I want is the ability to be able to not engage in those things Right. I don't want to subsidize them. I don't want to I don't want to sponsor them. Um, and I, I do want the ability to be able to live out my life and my faith and to be able to engage in discourse with people and converse with people and either voluntarily yeah. associate or voluntarily disassociate uh, with people on various issues. But I don't want I'm not going to try to use the government to come in and force people to live the way I think they should. Yeah. Um, and so there's some areas where the, the kind of the more you know, traditional old school Republicans would have been, well, of course, you know, we, we should ban this or we should do that. And my attitude is like, look, as long as you're not infringing on the rights and liberties of other people, I think they should be free to make their own decisions to include bad ones. Um, but I also shouldn't have to pay for those decisions and they shouldn't have to pay for mine. You know, let, let yeah. the marketplace, both of, of goods, services and ideas, ultimately ideas, let that play out. And, and I think that most people, when they're faced with the consequences of their actions, most people are able to make better decisions. And if they're not or if they need help, well, that's where the family comes in, civic organizations come in, the church comes in, charities come in, uh, neighbors come in, and, th and that's where you, you kind of help people figure it out. But we don't need massive government bureaucracies and programs that are constantly taking from one group of people in order to give it to another group of people because that, that breeds a sense of corruption, entitlement, and far from building up our communities, I, th I actually think it decimates them because people yeah. have this mentality that, well, I don't got to help my neighbor. That's, that's the government's job. Why do I pay taxes? 
And, you know, it's, it's interesting when I, when I'm talking to people about this sometimes, I'm like, you know, when Christ said, you know, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's um, and render to God that which is God's, um, that wasn't just a suggestion. Right? That, that was, you <laughs> yeah. know, that, that was letting you know a couple of things that one, if you render to Caesar things that don't belong to Caesar, Caesar will screw it up. And, and we have yeah. ample we have ample examples throughout history of Caesar screwing things up. And I think one of the, the biz, biggest examples of that is the government intervening in such a way where they've they've torn apart the family. Uh, they've torn apart the extended family in a, in a lot of ways. And so, um, yeah, I, I've always been involved in always been involved in politics, in part because my mom was also the head of a Republican women's group when I was growing up. And, you know, she would again, being a single mom, a nurse, a missionary, she was a busy woman, but she always thought it was important to be involved in the civic process and always taught us a, a, a real appreciation for how blessed we were to live in the United States and to be able to have a yeah. voice in that process and, and so therefore exercise it. Um, but yeah, my own political philosophy has evolved in the sense where I, I am I am far more I'm far more in the realm of saying that w- whenever I look at the potential for government to act or intervene, I, I usually ask myself four questions. Uh, you know, the first question is, is this constitutional? Because the Constitution is the contract which restricts government action. It's not meant to restrict individual. It's meant to restrict government action. Yeah. So I always ask that question first. The second one I ask is, is this a legitimate function of government? Is this something that we should reasonably be able to expect government to do? And for me, that list is very narrow. It, it usually includes protecting your property rights, protecting you know, uh, your liberties, and otherwise leaving you alone. Right? I'm, we're not here yeah. to prop you up. We're not here to slam you down. We're here to protect your right to live your life the way you want, provided you don't infringe on the rights of other people. Uh, the third question I usually ask is, what's the appropriate level of government to deal with something? So if it is constitutional, if it is a legitimate function, okay, what level, federal, state, or local? And I, I tend to favor more of the local or state approach because, one, I yeah. do believe that we're a very, very diverse country. Um, even in Virginia, you can point to eight distinct regions of Virginia where the economy is going to be very different. There's going to be cultural things that are very different. There's going to be different There's going to be different rules that make sense for one area of Virginia that don't make sense for another one. So don't try to impose it. For, I mean, gosh, for the love of all that is holy, don't try to impose it on 330 million Americans at the federal level. <laughs> don't even try to impose yeah. it on 8.4 million Virginians at that level. Let let the locality figure out what works, and if it works, great. Which makes sense. Yeah. And then the fourth question I always ask myself is, is the solution that's being offered one that is going to protect individual liberty and, and private property rights, or is it going to diminish those things? Because if it diminishes those things, I'm apt to think that we might be creating a bigger problem, no matter how good the intentions are. Um, you know, we, we, you know I, I'm, I'm happy to assume that my colleagues, even the ones I don't agree with, have noble intentions. But we don't legislate yeah. intentions. We write laws. And one of the things that I always tell students whenever I, whenever I get invited to <laughs> go speak to a civics class, I'll always ask them, I'm like, do you know what the one thing that is truly unique about the government is? And they'll say, oh, well, we get to vote for the government. I, can, you can, I said, you can vote for your basketball you know, players on your team when you go to a pickup game. You can vote <laughs> for the board of your company. You can, vote for, you can vote with you and your friends on where to go and have lunch that day. That's not unique. And they're like, uh, yeah. and they'll think about it for a while, and then finally, someone will say, "Well, the government gets to make laws." I said, "That's right." The number one defining characteristic of government is we get to use aggressive force and the threat of violence in order to get you to do what we want. So that is a very, very <laughs> unique authority. It's a very, very dangerous one. At times, it can be appropriate, but you better be yeah. really careful on what sort of responsibility you hand over to the people that can force you to do things. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of where I come from. Well, you you use an interesting word there on on handover, and that's where I, I find myself thinking about this a lot, especially in recent times. Uh, you mentioned James Madison, and I, I think a lot about them. Like I even I, I've read I like a lot of the George Washington. I mean, I thought he was those were just they were awesome dudes, uh, to put it put it lightly, but. I'll find myself wondering how much would they take at this point? Like I, that's where I, I imagine, you know, I just recently saw the 87,000 new IRS agents that they've added to the mix. And, and uh, you know, it seems like, you know, taxes and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, you know, at what point 
do we, do, at what point is it enough? Like that's where I, I find myself wondering and what would our founding fathers, would they still be putting up with what we're putting up with? Well, I, I think they would have had a, an enormous problem with it. But then the other question you have to ask is that, you know, the, the founding fathers grew, grew up in a, in a generation. And, and again, I don't want to, I don't believe in idolizing people or, or times or whatnot. Every, every person has their flaws. Every time has their, their high spots and their low spots. Um, yeah. But one of the things that was really prevalent at, at that day and age was this idea that if you were in the United States, if you were coming to the United States, there, there was at least this kind of cultural commitment to, again, this idea of individual liberty. We were a, we were a frontier country in, in many respects. Yeah. At that point, 13 different, you know, um, you know, states that really did see themselves as, as, you know, unified in certain purposes, but, but in large uh, part, very autonomous. And I, I think now we, we've entered into a, a culture where um, so many of our, our, our children, um, look, <laughs> I'll put it this way, and I'll try to, I'll try to be delicate here, um, no man, go on. Go, go. If you get if, you, if when when your kid when your kids are going to a government run school, right? We like to call them public schools, but let's let's be honest here. It's not public in the sense of a public road or a public park or a public you know bathroom, right? Not anybody can go into the school whenever you want and get an education, right? You as yeah. a parent can't even go into your kid's school whenever you feel like it. You can't do that. Um, you you can't you don't you can't monitor what's going on in that individual classroom. You're not allowed to do that. So it it is a it's a government run school, and if you look at a lot of the people that have been the most influential in determining what education looks like in the United States, you're going to come across guys like John Dewey. Within the higher education system, you're gonna you're gonna come across guys that were big into postmodernism, deconstructionism, uh, critical theory. These were not fans. Of, of the philosophy of the founding generation. They were not fans of individual liberty in, in the sense that we, yeah. we would consider. They were not fans of free market economics. They were not fans of, of private property rights. And, and a lot of what we got our educational system from was built around this idea that we were going to, we we're going to create a particular type of American. And, and that a type of American was going to be very well suited for, um, you know, conscription, they were going to be really well suited to maybe work in a factory. Um, and, and I don't, I don't, I just, I question whether or not that was a, and not only that, but they were also going to be very, very committed to the government. Yeah. Um, and, and you can see this. I, I remember going back and, and I, I went to public school and then we had a small uh, Christian school that was set up. And even in those textbooks, I remember looking at world, I remember looking at you know, the rendition of U.S. history and then going back and looking at it later from multiple different perspectives and realizing, you know, FDR did not save us from the Great Depression. <laughs> um, you know, th this massive government intervention that took place and started to reshape the way that we thought about the citizens' interaction of the government that took place in the, in the, in largely in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, I don't know that all of that was healthy. And yeah. because I, I've always, you know, we, we have this idea now where I think a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people have grown up in an environment where freedom equals democracy. Uh, no, <laughs> democratic processes might be an essential component of securing freedom, but if yeah. freedom is if freedom is nothing more than you getting to vote for who the people controlling the guys with guns are. That's not genuine freedom in any sort of real sense that this country was supposed to represent. Genuine freedom is you getting to make all of those critically important decisions with respect to how you're going to live your life, raise your family, the things that you're going yeah. to do and create and innovate. You know, um, everything from the car you drive to the livestock you raise. Those are your decisions. And, and to, to try to narrow that down into, no, 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 freedom is you were able to cast a vote for a representative, which will then cast a vote on issues, which will then come down and then direct your activity. Yeah. That's not, that's not freedom. And, and so I think a big part of it, when we ask the question, what our founders put up with it, I don't think they would have, but if our founders had been raised with, with this sort of mindset, well, then they wouldn't have known any better. Yeah. And so I, that's why I think it's, it's so critical that, um, you know, again, we just we raise our kids to understand that, you know, again, 
democratic processes are, are highly necessary and, and can be very, very appropriate, but that's not what freedom is. And that freedom, genuine freedom, comes with personal responsibility. If yeah. I'm free to do whatever I want and you're responsible for the consequences, well, then I, I'm not free. I'm licentious, right? I, I'm a leech. And you're certainly not free because you're the one that has to sacrifice your own freedoms in order to make up for the consequences of my actions. And so yeah. that, that dual part of, of teaching the importance of what liberty really means and, and the responsibility that goes along with it, I think, is critical. And I think the more we can teach that and raise kids with that inherent belief, the more they'll start to see the infringements that are constantly you know, coming about at this point, and the more they'll rebel about it and vote the appropriate way and respond the appropriate way to say, hey, look, no, you know, government has an appropriate function. Here's Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Feds, that's what you do. State. Yeah. You've got you've got some more realm to work in local. You've got some some more, but I'm going to keep you in your proper place because I don't belong to you, right? We're yeah. we're not a, we're not a government with a country. We're a country with a government. We're a people with a government. So. Well, it, it has unfortunately shifted uh, how I how I see it for sure uh, because at this point our government has so much power. Uh, it, it's insane, and and that's where. I, f I worry for the kids, you know, like you the same way. My, my kids are raised the way I was raised. That's how I'm raising them very much. Uh, I guess it would be a very non-politically correct way of raising them. And, uh, you know, my, my, my son knows he's a boy. My daughter knows she's a girl. And, they, and you know, they, we, we take them to church on Sunday. We sit down, we eat dinner together at the table. And we do these things. They, they're not on electronics. And... We do this to, one, I mean, to come closer as a family, but also to protect them. And, yep. and that's where, man, I fear for these kids. And it is interesting. You know, I, I had not, I really hadn't thought a lot about how their, I guess it's indoctrination would be the simple term of putting it, but that really is what's happening. And between the schools, and I really get worried on social media because America is painted in such a bad light. It's it's so crazy. I referenced this one time. I was scrolling on Instagram, and it was a, a, a clip out of the show, I believe, Modern Family. I've never watched it. Even the name may, is very unappealing to me. When I hear the name, <laughs> The Modern Family, I'm like, yeah. yeah, that doesn't sound like my cup yeah. of tea. Indicator. But uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And and it was a part and where it was a couple and two kids, I believe, or it may have been, it was two people and a kid, and they were at dinner. They were at a restaurant, and the kid was saying that he was, it was a boy, and I think he was saying he was gay. And uh, she was like, Sophia Vergara was the, the actress, and she's talking to him. She's like, oh, you just, you're, you're not gay. You just don't know uh, what you're talking about, whatever. And, and but she's not discouraging she, him. She's just like, no, nah, you know, you're, you're probably not gay, all this. Well, somehow that conversation shifts to don't be an American, like, because they're in America. Somehow this this weird shift on that goes to, well, you know, you don't want to be an American. You're you're an Italian living in America. Like, it, it like, makes this shift where it's, like, it's very frowned upon to be an American. Yeah. And it's really alarming to me watching that on a TV show because or on social media because people are on there Young kids, that's the ones I fear. Like, I know who I am, man. I'm, I'm 31 years old. I, I know who I am. I'm proud to be an American, uh, an American. You know, I'm not proud of my government, but I'm proud of my country yeah. um, is how I would put it. But it's, it's alarming to me to watch because, man, as you and I both know, there are a lot of young people that they, they are building their identities off of what they're seeing on social media. They see LeBron James share about how terrible the United States is and how, you know, Brittany, whatever her name is, it's overseas. You know, he's kind of like, I don't even know if I'd want to come back. And it's like, well, moron, why Bye. don't you go? We'll send you there too. <laughs> like, uh, and, and they see that. And unfortunately then they're like, man, this country really must not be that great. And, well, it, yeah, it's, and it's, so it's, it, it's popular to trash ahead. talk. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pop among, among a bunch of, Social uh, entertainment and athletic elites, 
who could never hope, um, or I, I will say in most cases, could not hope to experience the same sort of, of luxury and wealth uh, and security that they do in the United States, anywhere else in the world, doing what it is that they're doing. Yeah. Um, the ones that are, are trashing the United States because it's in vogue. It, it's a chic thing to do. Um, and and I, I find that just kind of pathetic. Um, I, I was commenting the other day, I said, you know, it's, it's, not just a, it's not just a positive reflection on the United States that people from all over the world are trying to get here. It's also a positive reflection in the United States that the people that are already here complaining the loudest about how horrible it is don't seem to want to leave. Right. Yeah. Like one of the yeah. one of the big benefits of the United States is if you really hate it that bad, you don't got to be here. And yet yeah. these people with the means to go anywhere they want in the world to live in luxury anywhere they want in the world still seem to want to stay here. And, and it's because yeah. they don't they don't buy their own crap. That's what it comes down yeah. to. They don't really you, you can you know. <laughs> Word, words are one way to judge people's actions, or excuse me, to judge what a, a person, but words are one way to judge how a person really thinks, but their actions are a far more reliable indicator. Yeah. And it, it, it may be chic and popular to, to trash the United States, but at the end of the day, this is where people want to come and live and raise their families, um, especially the people that are living in the sort of socialist utopias that we're supposed to want to emulate and, and think have got it all figured out. Um, again, I, yeah. I don't recall. I don't recall. I've been to Florida. I have never seen Floridians getting into leaky rafts in order to make it to the socialist utopia of Cuba. <laughs> but the reverse yeah. seems to happen on a daily basis. So maybe, maybe yeah. we should look at this as a subtle indicator um, that Hollywood's full of crap. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I share the frustration. But you, it, it's also a good point because when you talk about protecting your kids. Um, I, I've had people before where they've asked me, like someone was asked me, like, well, you know, when do you let your kids date? I said, when they're old enough to consider marriage. And they said, well, was that rule put on you when you were a kid? No. Well, don't you think that's hypocritical? Don't care. My job is not to make my kids a slightly better version of me. My job is to adequately prepare, train, and raise my kids to be everything that God created them to be. And that's yeah. an enormous responsibility that I take very seriously. And so I'm going to set up structure for them that I think is, is going to set them up for success. And then I'm going to go explain to them why I'm setting it up that way. Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, roll, I don't rule over my kids as a tyrant when I put up these restrictions. Um, when, when I say that there's certain things that they can't do that maybe some of their friends get to do, I explain why. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's really important because we have a culture right now and, and culture is largely made up of our, our academic, um, media, entertainment, music, arts. You know, the, these all realms help develop a lot with the culture. And, and I, I don't know if parents have noticed, but it tends to be openly hostile toward Judeo-Christian values. It tends to be openly yep. hostile toward what we used to probably would have considered um, traditional American values. It, it wants to denigrate the United States and essentially look at it through one lens or one perspective. And, and look, I am not someone, again, I don't have a romantic view of the United States in the sense that, well, gosh, we've always gotten it right. Clearly we haven't. Yeah. But the, the question yeah. is, is that underlying philosophy that you see within the Declaration of Independence, within the Constitution, especially within the Declaration, that we didn't, we, we, have, we have yet to fully live out. But that's the reason why right at the beginning of the Constitution, it says in order to create a more perfect union, we realize perfection isn't is not possible on this side of heaven? But man, we, we are trying to strive for it. And there's something noble yeah. in that pursuit. And, and I think that when you look at the United States and our experience compared with everywhere else in the world, we, we've, we've done a pretty good job. You know, Thomas Sowell always likes to say when somebody's trashing one thing, you always got to ask compared to what? Yeah. And, um, and so I, yeah. no, I, I applaud you. I, I think parents have an op. I, I, you know, again, when people hear being protective of their kids, it's like, that doesn't mean we, that doesn't mean we don't expose them to different ideas or even dangerous situations. I, I, I think when Jordan Peterson says, when your kids are doing dangerous things carefully, you got to let them have, you got to let them have the ability to get the skin knees. Um, yeah. while at the same time holding back the gates of things that are going to do real damage for them, either spiritually, emotionally, or physically, that's our job. 
And um, yeah. again, when you have a culture that's lined up against what you're trying to what you're trying to teach your kids, it is our obligation to step in and say, I'm going to say no right now, and this is why, and I'm going to explain it. And as you get older, you're going to help to understand it. But if you can establish that trust with your kids early on where they don't see you as a dictator, they will yeah. accept that. They will accept that because – let me give one example of this. I'm sorry. I'm filibustering right now. Um, no, you're good. Somebody asked me once, they're like, you know, do your, how do your kids respond to some of these rules, which based off of their doing are, are pretty strict. And I said, well, my kids have to, my kids have to know two things. They have to know I love them. They have to know I love them and that I'd, I'd die for them if I, if I had to. They, have to. they have to know that. And that's not something I can just tell them. It's something they have to see demonstrated on some level. So the yeah. other side is, is they have to know that when I tell them that there is such a thing as objective truth, that there is such a thing as right and wrong, they have to know that when I fall short of that standard and they call me out on it, respectfully, but when they call me out on it, they have to know I'll look at them and say, you know what, you're right. You're right, thank you. You're right and I was wrong. Yeah. Because the moment they call you out, the moment they get to that age where they can start to, they can see the life lessons that you've taught them and then they see you violate them because at some point you're going to. At some point you're going to yeah. say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or whatnot. And if they, if they come to you and they say, as my daughter, my oldest daughter did when she was about 14, daddy, can I talk to you? Yeah. I don't think he handled this well. And this is why every ounce of you is going to want to say, <laughs> I'm sorry, who are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in, in that moment, if you can, at that moment, if you can swallow your pride and if they're right and they've gone about it correctly and you can say, I was wrong, you were right. And I, I apologize. I apologize. Yeah. I will correct that. What you've just taught them in that moment is that the objective truth that you taught them applies to you too. And now I'm not teaching a child to just obey whatever an authority figure says. I've taught, a t I've taught my child that truth matters and they should feel strong enough and convicted enough about it to stand up for it in the face of authority. And that's what yeah. I want. I, I want to raise a child that is so dedicated to the truth that even when an authority figure that they love and respect that has control over a large part of their life does something wrong. They don't feel, they don't feel they have the courage to say that was wrong. And, yeah. and you want to foster that in your kids. And if you can do that, it, it does, it builds a level of trust with them that when they're older and every ounce of their, you know, 18 year old body wants to go do this or do that. And you say, honey, I, I can't let you do that. And this is why trust me. They do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, it's interesting it, because it's a, it's a strange kind of, I guess, I don't know if dichotomy would be the right word to use on it, but it's a strange one because children want discipline. Uh, it's, and you can see it, man. You see those kids, oftentimes the kids with no discipline, they, they show out because they just, they crave it, you know, and they crave that attention. And, and you can tell the difference between a structured kid I mean, my, my children, I'll, I'll brag a little bit on my kids, man. They, they actually just started 4K uh, this year. It's the first time they've gone to school. We've got a great a, a Christian private school that they go to. It's a small school, and it's, it's awesome. And they just started it. You know, I, I kind of was bummed. Uh, I'm used to it. With me farming, I'm used to being able to, you know, if I swing by the house, I could see them. So I'm getting used to that. Yeah. But... Uh, their teacher had told us like they they've been. She was like, it's like they've been in preschool uh, or been in school their whole life. She's like, they they are so well behaved and all this. And it's not because, I mean, it's not because my wife and I are just the best parents in the world. Yeah, it's because we we do discipline them like, and we you know we're already teaching them you know sir and ma'am. They're four years old. They're gonna say sir and ma'am. We we discipline them. And we have structure, you know, they, they go to bed at the same time. Like I said, we eat dinner together. They, so, and, and just these things, like it sounds simple and it is simple, really. Like it's not hard to raise, to, to me, I don't feel like it's a hard thing to raise good kids. If you just, you know, have that discipline, have that structure. I mean, was that, is, would you agree? Is that the same thing you've seen? Like, if somebody was listening to this and they're, they're like, Nick, how would you tell me? Like maybe they're a new dad or maybe they're a dad that has feels like they have failed these 10 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They got a 10 year old. What would you tell them? Well, I mean, the first thing I'll tell them is like, look, I'm, I'm the older your kids get, 
the harder it becomes to correct bad habits. Um, so you do have to start young with, with, with putting yeah. in structure and the rules. And, and like you, you said it perfectly, kids want to know what the rules are. I mean, heck, adults want to know what the rules are. When we go into an environment yeah. or a new country or a new job, the first thing we want to know is what are the rules? What are the left and right limits and what's expected of me? And, and yeah. that gives us the freedom to be creative and to find new ways and to come up with different ideas for things and stuff like that. But we still want to know what's the left limit, what's the right limit, what's the objective here? What am I doing here? Um, yeah. And so you, you do have to start that, that early. And there's so many things I look at now where I'm like, man, I wish I would have done this different. I wish I would have done this different. The one thing I, I try to tell parents is like, look, you, you got to remember, like your, your job is to, you know, you know, be faithful to your you know, God given responsibility to be a parent. You're not always going to get it right. Um, you know, and, and at some point your, your kids too, one of the things that I think is dangerous is that sometimes I, I've seen parents be so tough on themselves that they create an environment where they almost give their kids an out. Like if their kids see that the, the parents are just, Oh, I should have done this. And I should have done that. I should have done that. Their kids get to a certain point where like, yeah, you should have done that. And, and yeah. we, we, one of the things we try to instill in our kids very early on is like, look, our job is to do our best. And yeah, we owe things, but you're still responsible for you. You know, whether yeah. we succeed or whether we fail, you're still responsible for you. And yeah. um, and there's little ways that you, you can do that. Like what I so when my kids were little, again, setting that structure, um, you know, when when our when my kids were super little, people would always ask, you know, do you spank? And I would say, well, look, <laughs> when my kids were really little and, and they didn't understand certain complex concepts like they don't understand, don't go out and play in the street. Yeah. Right? But they do it. But but if I give them a little swat on the on the tush there, you know, that doesn't really hurt them. But it's enough to know, oh, if I do that, I'm going to associate that with pain. Right. Yep. If I touch yeah. if I touch the hot yep. stove now, I could let them touch it and like maybe really burn themselves or I can swat their hand and they they yeah. associate it with pain. But cognitively, as they start to develop, you explain these things. This is why I do these things. And, and again, they, they develop that trust that mommy or daddy wouldn't do this unless it, it was formed because I know they love me, right? They've got to know you love yeah. them first. Yeah. But then it, it, it going through the process and, and actually explaining why the rules are there, why the boundaries are there, and why it is there for them is important. Like, you never want arbitrary rules. A parent that raises their kid with rules being totally arbitrary and because I said so will create a kid that will do whatever the professor tells them to because the authority figure said so. Mm. They will do whatever yeah. the government tells them to because the government's the authority figure, right? There, there's got to be an authority above you, and that's got to be truth, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and again, I, for, that, that's God, right? God makes the rules. I'm just here to you know, carry them out. So I, I, think yeah. that's, I think that's a big important component. And then the other thing, too, is, is, is instilling in them a sense of responsibility over things you know, early on. We used to tell all of our kids, I don't owe you a college education. I don't owe you a college education. I don't owe you a car. I don't owe you a phone. Now, some of these things I might provide, maybe. Some of these yeah. things I might assist you with. But you are never to, you are never to think that I owe you this. If you want yeah. this, I will teach you how to work for it and get what you what you would like. I will I will teach you on how to do that process. And and I'll tell you what, nothing is one of the things that made me so proud is my my daughter was a Senate page here in the Virginia uh, Senate. And they paid him to do that, and they also paid him a per diem. So it was a pretty good gig, right? Um Yeah. My daughter, we didn't tell her to do this. My daughter, so a lot of her friends would take their per diem and they'd go across the street to the, the restaurant there across from the hotel where they were staying at. They could go over there in, in groups of four and whatnot, and they could order meals. And it was the first time being out. My daughter would save up her money. She would eat grilled cheese sandwiches because she could get them for like $2. And she just packed yeah. all that money up, saved all that money up. And as soon as she became 16, she bought her own car. We didn't give her a dime. She had That's that car. Awesome. She, she wanted to go to, she wanted it like, uh, she graduated high school right as um, COVID hit. She wasn't quite sure, you know, what she wanted to major in, but she didn't want to waste a bunch of money if she didn't know what she wanted to do. So she's like, I'm going to go to cosmetology school because I know that no matter where I go, I can make money doing cosmetology school and I can, I can provide. Yeah. So she worked the late shift at McDonald's driving her used, you know, vehicle there, saved up $20,000 and paid her way through it. 
And then when her yeah. car all of a sudden, you know, she needed she needed new brake pads, she needed new brakes. Like, sweetheart, it's eighteen hundred dollars to get it done, or you can buy the material and you can do it yourself. She got, and this comes from her, <laughs> uh, this part I got to give her mother credit for, not me, because I'm not a mechanic, man. I wish I was. I know I lose man <laughs> points every time I say it, but but her mother is her mother is just mechanical, just. If if there is a YouTube video for how to build a rocket ship, Tina can, Tina can do it. Dude, and, YouTube but, is the the weapon, man. Oh man, she pulled up YouTube, learned how to do it. She goes, "I can pay eighteen hundred bucks to have someone else do it, or I can do it for six hundred. And it was a pain, <laughs> right? And it took her the whole yeah. weekend, but she saved a thousand bucks, you know, doing doing it that, that is way. Awesome. <laughs> and so little things like that, and and not only that, but when they have those triumphs. When, when you see them applying the principles that you've taught them, taking responsibility for something and then succeeding, man, you got to heap on that praise. You got to let them know, I am so proud of you yeah. that you did that. Because uh, that's the other thing, too. The, the kids, they, they do, you know, if they love and respect their parents, they, they, want, they want that, um, they want your love, but there's going to come a certain age, too, where they, they also really, really want your respect and admiration. And when they do things worthy of respect and admiration, that's where it gives you the, as, as the opportunity as a parent to give it to them and then to also allow more freedom associated with that heightened degree of personal responsibility, that, that heightened demonstration yeah. that they understand the responsibility that comes with additional freedom. Uh, and so look for that. But the other thing, too, I, I will tell parents, and this is the last thing, and then I'll finish here. I know I, I went a little bit long on that. Um, Respect is something that is taught very, very early on. Uh, respect is reciprocal to some degree. Um, the other thing, too, that I think is really important for fathers and husbands, um, w there, there is a absolute travesty going on right now with just hookup culture. Um, you know, and, and this is the over-sexualization of our kids and, and yep. raising your kids to respect their bodies and to have a respect for the other person's, you know, body and, and, and we put very strict boundaries. We, we raised our kids with the idea that, you know, sex is a beautiful thing that God intended between a man and woman in marriage. And he did that to yeah. protect you. And he did it because it's going to be better if you do it that way. And, yes. and so one of the things that we really stress with our kids and what I, I stress is like, I'll, I'll never forget one of my kids, you know, um, early teenage years, kind of, you know, filling their oats a little bit, uh, smarted off to their mother rounded the corner and didn't see me standing there. And then all of a sudden they're face to face with me. And I remember looking at him and saying, don't you ever speak to my wife that way again? Because at that point, there was a, a couple lessons that are being taught there. One is you will respect my wife because she is worthy yeah. of it. She is worthy of respect. But the other lesson that you're teaching right there is, and that is what you should expect from your husband or your wife one day when you have kids, you should yeah. respect that they have your back even when they don't know it. Um, and, and I, I just, I think that's so creating that, creating that environment where they can see a healthy relationship because our kids learn to expect what marriage should look like based off of how they see their moms and dad, mom and dad interact with one another. And that doesn't mean yeah. you hide every disagreement. Um, doesn't mean you hide every argument, but there always has to be a certain level of respect maintained between a husband and wife period. Uh, you know, even, you know, more so in, in front of the kids. Um, but I, I just, I think that's critical. I agree. And I, I like the wording on that. When you, like, if you're faced with that, you know, instead of just saying, don't you're, you will respect your mother yeah. or don't disrespect your mother. I like the don't disrespect my wife. That yeah. to me, that even kind of, that even sets a different dynamic to them. Like it shows like, yes, they're, they're, you're not just disrespecting your mom. You're disrespecting my wife. Yeah. And, oh, it and so that, that even, it does, man. It does. <laughs> like, and uh, so I, I like that. And now I'm curious, is there, how different is it when you got a boy or a girl? Because the, especially even on the praise thing, yeah. because I, I would say a lot of men and uh, you know, you may can relate in this, you know, as we had that older generation, like like my dad's dad, uh, World War II vet, very very hard man. You know, I I would venture to say he rarely told my dad like, 
you know, great job, man. You know, doing doing a great job. Like yeah. pat him on the back. That just that was not really their style. And and so I I would say, you know, I've had a similar thing. And I'll tell you, man, it 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 matters. It matters. Yeah. Boys need to hear that praise, I would say, just as much as girls do. And and I'm curious, like, what is how do you see that? Have you seen a difference from your daughters needing that from boys or what? I, yeah, I think it's. I, I think they both need it. I think sometimes it manifests itself differently. Yeah. So, for instance, I, I noticed. I noticed pretty early on with my girls that um, daddy's disappointment was sufficient. Um, yeah. Didn't need to raise my voice. Didn't daddy's disappointment was sufficient. Um, and and again, you you be careful on on how you use that. That's not necessarily you know it, it's not inappropriate for them to feel disappointment when their actions are disappointing. Yeah. Um, and so they need to feel secure in your, in your love for them. I think that's very, very important, but they also need to know, again, there's objective right and wrong. There's a way to do yeah. things. There's a way not to do things. And, and when you, you do the wrong thing, there's consequences for that. Sorry. Um, yeah. with boys, I, I, you know, boys, I think they're a little bit more rough and tumble. Uh, you know, our, our, our cognitive abilities don't develop at the same speed. Our maturity doesn't develop at the same speed. You know, I heard somebody say once that um, <laughs> uh, men civilize the frontier and women civilize men. <laughs> but yeah. um, but I, I think that uh, the other thing, too, is, and not everybody subscribes to this, uh, you're preparing them for different things. And, and I don't mean that. Um, you know, men have to do one thing and women have to do another as far as careers are, are oriented or, or things like that. I just mean that ultimately I, I do believe that there's there's different roles that are played within a marriage between the husband and the wife. And yep. one is not more important than the other. I think they're equally important and they're um, it's symbiotic. And it, it's interesting because um, I'll give you a quick story. I was I was talking to this one gal. She had just gotten engaged and I said, hey, we're up in D.C., group of people. And I said, Hey, I just want to encourage you. Uh, you know, so many people trash marriage or speak about it flippantly. I love being married. Being married is great. My wife is wonderful. I love raising kids. And we were talking a little bit about raising kids. And I said something about my son, you know, raising him to, you know, protect and provide. And she goes, Oh, we don't subscribe to those traditional gender roles. I said, Oh, <laughs> I said, okay. I said, can I ask you a question Welcome to DC? I guess yeah. <laughs> I said, can I ask you a question? She goes, yeah, sure. I said, you and your fiance are out at a lovely dinner. I mean, he's just nailed it, right? Took you out to a wonderful restaurant. And as he's he's walking you back to the car, um, somebody jumps out of the alleyway with a knife. Now, in one of these scenarios, your fiance jumps in between you and the assailant. And in the other scenario, he jumps behind you. In which scenario are you more attracted to your fiance? And she looks at me and she goes, that's not fair. I said, you can blame me for how reality affects the way you analyze this. But I, I would yeah. argue that it is very fair. Um, the, the bottom line is, is that, and again, if, if you believe, uh, you know, I'm a man, of, a man of faith, I think God created a particular order. It goes back to the whole idea of understanding, you know, kind of the way things were laid out. And again, that doesn't mean, gosh, that doesn't mean that a woman has to be some, you know, you know, subservient version of the handmaid's tale. It doesn't mean they can't have careers and ambitions and opinions and thought. I want them to have yeah. all that. If you met my wife, you would meet an incredibly strong woman that wins almost every argument. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm trying to train my daughters to have a healthy respect for themselves to, um, to be ambitious and innovative and creative and, and to also, um, you know, to, to the extent that I can prepare them to, you know, be mothers um, yeah. and then with my son, I'm preparing him to be a man. And, and one of the things I will say is that there, there are, there are times where I will be harsher with my son. Um, because I do believe that he will have a role to play where he will have to deal. He may very well have to deal with harsh realities and he might have to deal with dangerous and violent ones. And one of the yeah. realities of being a man is, is that when men interact, there is always this subtext of violence being on the table. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, when I hug my son or, you know, I say hi to my dad or I, I you know, meet you, I'm like, oh, I'm thinking, oh, there's a violent component. No, it just means that we understand that we are responsible to have to protect 
and defend and sacrifice in the face of that. Yeah. And if you haven't adequately prepared your son to deal with that reality, you have not done him any services by saying, oh, well, we don't subscribe to those traditional gender roles. Well, I guarantee you the guy with the knife in the alleyway doesn't care about what you've subscribed to or not. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and your, yeah. your son or your daughter, you got to prepare both of them for it, need to be prepared to deal with situations like that in life and need to be fairly confident. So, yeah, I've taught my daughters how to fight and I've taught my daughters how to shoot. And I've taught my son how to do the same thing. But I, 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 there's that added emphasis with a boy. And, and here's, here's the way I'll describe it. Because someone asked me once, they're like, why does the man have to be the head of the household? Or why does anybody have to be the head of the household? And I said, what do you think that means? They said, well, it means the man gets to make the decision. I'm like, oh, 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 let me, <laughs> let me walk you back here. Let me walk you back here and explain what this means from a biblical perspective. First of all, when someone asked me, how did I know my wife was the one? Like, well, that's easy. I married her. Now, yeah. there was all the things that I loved and, and appreciate about, love and appreciate about my wife. I like, I love, my wife is the most beautiful, creative, intelligent, just wonderful woman on the planet. And the moment I said, I do, that was it. I do. She's it. Like, she needs to be able to depend on me for the rest of her life, no matter what. Said in, in, in the 24 years in marriage, I can probably count on one hand the number of times we have had a disagreement about a course of action that we couldn't come to some sort of compromise on yeah. where it was like, okay, yeah, we both agree. This is the right course of action. And you got to remember, this is spanning a marriage where two combat tours, multiple deployments, the first 10 years of my marriage, five years of it was spent away from, from the home, three kids, eight, you know, 14 moves. Like it, it's, it hasn't been just happy go lucky. Yeah. yeah. It's been a lot. And only, only three or four times where she said, Nick, I, I don't agree but I trust you. Now, I have to be worthy of that trust. I have to be worthy of the respect that Scripture tells her to show me. How do I become worthy of that respect? She has to know. She has to know with every fiber of her being that I am absolutely committed the moment we got married and the moment we had children that their needs, their welfare, and their safety are a superior concern to anything else in my life. Not my ambitions, not my preferences, and not my own safety. Yeah. The deal I struck when I married my wife was my life for hers. She's the number one. She is God's the number one priority. She's the number one priority in that relationship, in that marital relationship. So she has to know that I have to carry the responsibility of making the decision that I think is best for the family. When we can't agree, and that I'm willing to sacrifice everything for, for her safety. And if you can do that, and if she can trust that you mean it, then, then you're going to have a marriage where, one, I think you're going to have very, very few situations where you can't come to, you can't come to the same agreement on what the best course of action is. Yeah. But on the ones where you do, if when you said till death do us part, you meant it, then you better be the sort of man that she can trust to make that decision when you can't agree understanding that her safety and the safety of your children and your family comes before your own. And I, I just, I think that's critical. Yeah, I agree, man. And that's well, and, and all of that is exactly when I look at society and, and marriage, I mean, what is the, the statistic of marriage uh, today? Like 52 or 51% fail yeah. uh, divorce rate is going crazy. And um, I just recently, you know, I thought of something have you ever seen secondhand lines? Yes. Man, yeah. I just recently watched the clip where I can't remember his name in the movie, but Robert Duvall is at like, they're in this, this like, I guess it's kind of like a general store or something. And these kind of punks come and are messing with them. And dude, that, that, that whole scene and the icing on the cake is at the end of his phrase. So for people that haven't seen the movie, yeah, it's a punk kid messing with them. And, uh, his buddy tells him not to kill the kid. He's like, Hey, he's a punk kid. Just don't kill him. And like walks off and, you know, Duvall grabs the dude by the throat and he pins him up. And he's like, 
he, he sells them, you know, I, I served in the, the military. I led men in these battles. I've been on these shores. But the best part, man, is at the very end, he says, and I have loved one woman with a passion a flea like you would never know or something. Yeah. And that, that to me, I, me and a buddy, man, I sent that to him. It was on Instagram, so a, a page I followed had shared it. And I sent it to him and I was like, dude, the, the last line of that makes that the most just bad to the bone phrase. Like I have, and, 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 and it's so opposite to today's culture. Yeah. You know, we are, like you said, man, overly sexual, everything like, you know, if you pulled up a modern guide to being a man, it would be how many women have you slept with? Like yep. that's, that's like, that is the image of a man. And it's like, man, let's look at the, you know, like you say, you, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I, I, I'm idolizing the world war two generation. Cause was there men back then that cheated, lied and steal? I mean, absolutely. You know, that's, that's human nature. We are inherently, we are inherently bad. I mean, by nature, and so it were they that way yes but it it was it's interesting how you know back then it was manly really to be uh, like faithful to your wife and to yeah. be with one woman and that's that's what man I'd love to see us get back to that I mean that's you know I'm the same well, way man I, I've known my yeah go ahead more more guys like you saying that because I, I yeah I've seen that scene I love that scene that whole thing and and you you really pointing out that part of it, the part that really just ties it in is, and I've loved one woman with passion, right? They're like, yeah, because you're right. It, there, there's an element of that that has been lost by this hookup culture, by this idea that for man, it's all about the body count, right? Sowing your wild oats, garbage, absolute garbage. And yeah. and again, I got I got married at 19. I'm so glad I did for a number of reasons, but somebody was, was asking about this and, and it used to be kind of a joke, right? SF team, bunch of green berets, right? You go all over the world and, and like, I've only ever been with my wife and, yeah. and I'm, and I'm not only, you know, proud of that for what it means for me, I'm proud of it for what it means for her too. I mean, she knows she's never being compared to anyone else. Yeah. And, and every once in a while, you know, I, I had some good buddies who were, they were some dogs, right? You know, but they they give me they give me crap about that every once in a while. And one time I just looked at one of them and I said, "You got a GED and you don't even know how many women. I got a PhD in one. Who do you really think knows what they're doing?" And, That's and a great way kinda, of looking at it. He just kind of looked at me and I was like, "Yeah, don't don't think for a second, Hoss. You got anything on, on what I got with my wife in a relationship where I again I love her with passion." Yeah. You lust at you lust after the girl that you just saw in the bar whose name you're not even going to remember. There's no there there's no real passion involved in that. You're just you're scratching an itch, man. Yeah. Right? This is this is the this is the woman I am passionate about and I get to have her, only me. And she gets yeah. to have me, only me. Right? And and there there is there is a connection in that. And there is a safety and security that you provide your wife in that, um, that, you know, again, it, I just, I just, I think you're going to have a hard time experiencing, but this goes to another point though, with how sons raise or how fathers raise their sons. Sometimes I saw so many dads, some of those some, same guys, right? Well, my daughter better be home by 10 and better be do this and better not do that. And I'll kill him if he touches her. And then they look over at their boy and say, have a good time. Just wear a condom. Yeah. Well, what have you done? You've taught your son to be the sort of man that you're telling your daughter to avoid, right? And yeah. what you've really told your daughter, too, is that the rules are arbitrary and sexist, right? I'm not saying this yeah. because I love you and I protect you. I'm just saying this because, you know, you're weak or you're not able to do it or, or you get pregnant and what. No, you teach both of them that, that God, has somebody, God has somebody for them. And, and when they meet that person, how much do they want to have to explain? Right? How much baggage do you want to carry into that? Or yeah. do, you want to be able, do you want to be able to go into that marriage? Do you want to be able to go into that environment, giving them the gift that only they possess? Right, It's only theirs. And, and the same for you. And, and look, I want to caveat this because I know that in this culture, there's, there's a lot of people that, you know, especially, gosh, you're in your mid-20s, older. You, you, you've probably done some stuff, male or female. I, I don't mean to imply that you can't still have a, a great, wonderful marriage, but I, I will say this. If, if, you're going to, if you're going to embrace hookup culture, 
don't be surprised when you pay for it later. On, on yeah. some level, it may be subtle. You may not even realize it. Um, but don't be don't be surprised when you pay for it later. But man, if, if you can if you can make that commitment um, to to honor the person you're going to marry before you even meet them, gosh dang that pays off dividends. But what it takes is other men saying no, that's the way it's supposed to be. And if you're going to come to me yeah. and brag about how many people you slept with, I'm going to look at you like you're a punk. All right. So. Well, you know what? The way I look at that, because um, man, I, like I said, I'm the same way. Like I, my wife and I have only ever been with each other, yeah. and that's, you know, culturally, that's not a cool thing to say. You know, yeah. that's not the like cool thing to say. But the way the thing I've always thought about the guys that brag about uh, the the amount of women that they've slept with, I always think about. I'm like, do you know how easy it would be j- to be just like you? Yeah. Like that's to me is not an accomplishment today. Mm. Sex is nothing. Like, I mean, the look at, it, I mean, it's everywhere. It's not hard to do that. <laughs> like that's where I look at it. It's like, dude, dude, I could, I could be just like you with minimal effort uh, versus at this point, like if, and again, no dig on people that have gone down that path, but uh, you can never be, you'll never have that with just one person, you know, like you will never have that. And, you know, it's unfortunate for people that have given themselves away, I guess is what I would say. I mean, it's unfortunate for them, especially if they, you know, they regret it and they, they're trying to, to do the right thing. But, um, man, I mean, it's just, it's, it's wild. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way, man. Like I'm, I will raise my daughter, uh, to be, to respect her body and, and, from a Christian perspective, you know, I'm going to raise her, you know, we wait till marriage. I'm going to raise my son the same way. And, uh, you know, I, I credit a lot of my, like being able to do what I did, but to, I just have always marched to the beat of my own drum. Like I never really cared, uh, what people thought. And typically I got along with everybody. Like I have found that it really doesn't matter that much to people. Like I think we think it matters more yeah. than it actually matters to oh, people no, it it's kind of like you know if you go to the gym for the first time and you're scared somebody is going to see you maybe you don't bench press a lot and you're afraid people to see in all reality most people don't care yeah. <laughs> you know yeah well i think i think like you said too it's it's kind of a unique opportunity because when you do um when you do make a decision along those lines and again i you know i always try to caveat this with saying look, if you, you, if you want to line up all the dumb decisions I've made or stupid things I've done or things where I've fallen out of my own philosophy, dude, I'll get you a paper and a pen, man. (laughs) Like it's, it's kind (laughs) of, it's there. Um, but it's, and so one of the things I try to emphasize is like, I don't hold myself up as some sort of model for this. Right. I look at it more as I've seen this model work. Um, and I didn't come up with the model. It's not my idea, right? Like I didn't create this. I've just seen it work. Um, and just like I'd be excited to tell somebody about, you know, <laughs> you know, a, a new gun I got that I just love or, you know, uh, you know, whatever it is, a new, a new power tool that I think is great. It's like, look, this works. So do yeah. it. Um, and, and, and be, be proud of it. Um, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, I think you're, I think you're right on that. When you, when you stand up and you're doing something, especially against the flow and it, and it works, um, it's something to be proud of. And, and when it's funny too, because you'll, you'll watch people that they'll almost try to gang up sometimes to make themselves feel better about their own decisions. And when you're like, yeah, not impressed, man. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that, that's the thing that causes people to think about this, um, is when, is yeah. when someone's willing to stand up against the group and say, nah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it does. It, it shakes them, man. Cause they're, most people, a lot of people will just go with the flow uh, of whatever seems to be the cool and popular thing. Yeah. Uh, actually, a really good buddy of mine, we just had this conversation about today. It's really strange to think about this, but you fall in the same category. You, me, uh, you know what? Today, in today's day, we are the punk rockers. <laughs> um, which is a strange way to think about it, but it's true. We really are. You yeah. know, back in the day, the punk rockers were like, you know, they were the ones going against the flow. And I, and I mean, really today that is us. And isn't that weird to think about like conservative values 
make you the punk rocker yeah. of today. Yeah, we're, we're the we're the rebels. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's funny you talk about some of these people like speak truth to power. It's like you're in the sociology department of UC Berkeley, repeating everything your professors said and getting yes. rewarded for it. Like you ain't speaking to power. You're not rebelling against the system. Um, yeah, no, no, it's it's true. It's it's kind of funny. <laughs> it is. It is, man. Hey, uh, we're reaching our time here, Nick. Where can where can people follow you? This has been a, a blast. Well, no, thank you very much for having us on. I mean, we're on we're on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, Instagram. Uh, Nick J. Freitas on Instagram. We've also got we've got two podcasts that we do, or one podcast, another show we do. It's called uh, the podcast is called Making the Argument. And the whole purpose of that thing, if I could just sum it up real quickly, is we've talked to so many people that as they're confronted with so many issues that are are hitting them today, whether it's cultural, whether it's political, whether it's, you know, theological, philosophical, and they're frustrated. They don't know how to answer these these assaults on their values because they're busy yeah. living their lives. And we yeah. said, you know what, look, we have to be immersed in this, me because of politics. Um, you know, so we want to be able to present people with good arguments for what it is that we believe arguments that they can be confident yeah. in arguments they can be and how to respond to the most common questions. So on making the argument, that's what we do. We will take an issue. We'll do our round table talking about this from multiple perspectives. Um, Hamilton will come in and just fire like, okay, here's the five most common questions that people get asked. How do you respond? And so that's our yeah. point is we want to equip people to be able to, you know, have faith in their ability to defend what they believe. So that's making the argument. Um, that's on, uh, YouTube. It's, it's on, uh, Apple podcasts, Spotify, et cetera. Then we have another program we do called the why minutes. And these are like three minute episodes where we will take some sort of concept or idea and we'll, we'll look at it from a different perspective. And it, there's kind of that aha moment. Um, yeah. so to give, give you an idea, we did one episode where it was why do oppressive governments love gun control? And we, we really did it from this per perspective of colonialism in, in Africa, where we said, you know, for all these people that are telling you that, that this is all about safety or whatnot, yeah, they said the same thing to people they were trying to <laughs> oppress and dominate and rule. And so yeah. we, we, try to, we try to hit a particular topic from a different vantage point where there's that aha moment where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, this isn't just, this isn't quite as simple as I've been told, right? Um, but yeah. those, that's called the Y Minutes. And again, Facebook, YouTube, it's easy to find. But um, but yeah, our, our social media is easy to find. And then the, check out the Y Minutes and, um, and making the argument. Well, I definitely encourage everybody to check it out. I, I got one question left for you on that, Ben. When, when are we going to see see your uh, your presidential campaign man when are we gonna see that <laughs> well, it's like I've, I've told people before i i don't say never because i figured out the hard way you don't tempt god with never statements right um yeah. either you know god's sovereign and the moment you say i'll never do that he has a way of of uh proving you wrong i i would i had zero ambition zero ambition to run for president <laughs> Um, you know, I, I had, uh, I, I was running for something once and I was, I was talking with Senator Ted Cruz and he asked me, um, what do you want to be known for? And I said, you know what, <laughs> Senator, to be, to be totally honest, um, I don't want to be known for anything around politics. It, if I do my job correctly, the government will be back in its proper place and it will be so insignificant in people's day-to-day -day lives that they'll have no reason to remember me. Um, I want my, <laughs> I want my wife to remember me as a good husband. I want my kids to remember you as a good father. My friends to remember me as a good friend. And, and hopefully, um, when, when I show up I'll, I'll, to my maker, I'll hear well, well done, good and faithful servant because yeah. I, I want to live my life and I don't always do this successfully but I want to live my life in such a way where I'm more concerned about what God says when I show up than what man says when I'm gone. Um, so that, that should be the ultimate goal. And then whatever challenges God puts in front of you, you be obedient to that. And I don't think you'll be disappointed in this life or the next. Yeah, man. I think that's great. I think that's great. Well, well, man, Hey, I, I appreciate what you're doing. I think we need more people, uh, in the trenches doing what you're doing. And, uh, that's why I really like what you're doing with the podcast as well, because man, the information, uh, we get plenty of bad information out there online. So it's nice to have some good information going out there as well. Uh, so I encourage everybody to check it out. 
Uh, what's your handle on Instagram? Uh, Nick J. I can Freitas. Uh, yeah. If they, okay. if they just, if you type in anything close to Nick J. Freitas, we'll, we'll, we'll usually come up. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well guys go check out what Nick and them are doing. Uh, it is awesome. Like I said, I hope you've gotten a good understanding of who he is in this episode and, uh, you know, you can trust what he's saying and, uh, guys, I appreciate it. If you tuned in, please leave us a rating and a review and, uh, we'll catch you next time.